good afternoon and thank you for joining us this afternoon for the Virginia Tech Shenandoah Valley Agricultural Research and Extension Center 2020 Virtual Field Day. My name is Gabe Pent and I'm the superintendent here at the farm. As a result of the ongoing pandemic, we're unfortunately not able to host our typical in-person field day, but we're still excited to have this opportunity to present a detailed look at some of the studies that have been done here at the research farm over the past few years. Uh, we've also developed a proceedings publication as in years past, and we'll share this on our website and via email to the participants after this event. We will have a short time for a question and answer after each presentation, so uh, be sure to submit your questions as you think of them, and we'll answer them in order once they are, um, once the presentations are complete. Also, one more housekeeping item, if you do need continuing education credits, we'll submit a poll at the conclusion of this event, and then you can select the type of credits that you'll need and submit your name and, and contact information for the sign-in sheet. Those credits include DCR, Conservation Planner, Certified Crop Advisor, and Certified Forage and Grassland Professional and Apprentice credits. I do want to acknowledge our sponsors of uh, this event. Uh, this would not be possible without their support. Uh, this includes ABS Global, Augusta Equipment Company, Blue Ridge Animal Clinic, Corteva AgriScience, Farm Credit Service, Gallagher Power Fence, Gilliam and Mundy Drilling Company, the Headwater Soil and Water Conservation District, James River Equipment, King's Agri-Seeds, Pearson Livestock Equipment, Rockbridge Farmers Cooperative, Roundstone Native Seed, Seedway, Select Sires, Southern States Cooperative, Stay Tough Fence, and the Virginia Cattlemen's Association. Since we can't visit in person with our sponsors, uh, I will ask that you be sure to, to thank them next time that you visit with them. Again, this event wouldn't be possible without their help. One last note before we begin, our, our last field day was in 2017. Since then, as many of you are aware, the McCormick Farm lost one of its greatest advocates and caretakers, David Fisk. David was superintendent of the Shenandoah Valley AREC from 2000 through 2018. And under his leadership, this farm became a premier research and demonstration farm focused on beef cattle production systems, performance tested rams, and forest management. As many of you know, David preserved and cared for the history of this historic McCormick farm, ensuring that the story would continue to be told for generations here. Uh, David has been and will continue to be sorely missed, and it's in his memory that we host this event. Through the generous support of members of the Virginia Forge and Grassland Council, along with others, a handcrafted stone bench, as you can see in this picture, was erected in David's memory here at the farm. And at the bottom of the bench, uh, there's a plaque that's noted, David was dedicated to the advancement of agriculture and the betterment of rural communities. And our primary objective here at the Shenandoah Valley AREC will be to continue that legacy. All right, now I'd like to begin with a welcome uh, for participants to this field day, prepared by Dr. Saeed Mastagimi, who's Dean of the Virginia Agricultural Experiment Station and Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Studies in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences here at Virginia Tech. Welcome to Shenandoah Valley Agricultural Research and Extension Center's Field Day. I'm Saeed Mostagimi, Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Studies at Virginia Tech College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. I also serve as the Director of Virginia Agricultural Experiment Station. I truly wish that we were able to be together at the AREC today, but our in-person field days are one of many casualties of the COVID-19 pandemic. Although many aspects of our lives have been impacted by COVID-19, Fortunately, we've been able to continue much of the work that is going on at 11 agricultural research and extension centers throughout the state, as well as in laboratories in Blacksburg. We're able to keep social distancing while continuing the work that is vital to maintaining and promoting Virginia's number one private industry, agriculture, strong and thriving. At any given time in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, there are over 2,000 
thousand projects that are going on, ranging all the way from fundamental research that sets it up to address the, cha the future challenges to very practical issues that our stakeholders are currently dealing with. These 11 agriculture research and extension centers are very critical to the land grant mission of Virginia Tech in that the faculty conduct the research to create knowledge and then through their extension and outreach program disseminate that knowledge to our stakeholders, producers and communities. We value your engagement and your support of our AREX, your continued engagement help us develop programs that are meaningful and relevant to the needs of the stakeholders. Again, on behalf of this AREC and on behalf of Virginia Tech, I would like to thank you for all of what you do and for, the, for your partnership with us. Also, thank you for all of what you do in support of agriculture in the Commonwealth. Research and extension programs at this center covers livestock production, forages, and forage systems, and a small scale forestry and woodlot management. The center's beef cattle program includes breeding, reproduction, nutrition, and management, as well as controlled rotational grazing and forage systems. Sheep programs include ram performance testing and commercial ewe lamb development. The goal of this work is to help develop a more forage-based sustainable agriculture industry in Virginia and to be a leader in livestock and forage-based research and education in the mid-Atlantic region of the United States. Before I turn it over to the rest of our speakers, we would like to share with you a few comments from our stakeholders about the impact of the AREX as a network. We truly appreciate your partnership with us and please don't hesitate to contact me or the AREX directly if there is something that we could do to help you. Thank you. These AREC centers scattered over the state. They are serving the largest industry in the state of Virginia outside of government and military. Research done here can be used for the benefit of private landowners within the state of Virginia, public land holdings. We farm approximately 4,000 acres. We also have a, uh, a company that uh, exports food uh, quality soybeans. If it hadn't been for the soybean variety development program at Virginia Tech, that export business wouldn't exist. This research Research Center is very important to us and all of my surrounding farmers uh, in this five or six county area with the research that they do. Technology in agriculture and the farming community has just exploded. You know, what we were doing five years ago, agriculture practices we were doing on our farm five years ago are not the same as what we will be doing five years from now. I know for a fact that AREC here is, is staying on top of that and um, they're, they're helping by coming to growers and letting them know about the new technology that's out there. Um, here's how we can be doing something different through the AREC's help. Um, we, we found that we can um, mitigate the amount of fertilizer and the usage of fertilizer that we're putting out so um, we're only putting out the right amount that the plant needs and the plant can take up um, at that any given time and um, it's not going out and getting into the Chesapeake Bay. As the population of the world grows we're trying to find more and more ways to grow more and more food uh, with less land so I hope I can make a positive change in agriculture too and and through Virginia Tech and through um, the AREC here to help with the AREC and extension that um, you know that's uh, something that we can we can all you know do pretty easy so with their help thank you dr muskimi for preparing these comments and uh for sharing some input from farmers and other agricultural professionals about the role and value of arex here it's good to have you joining us today we are also joined today by congressman ben klein congressman klein represents virginia's sixth congressional district in the u.s house of representatives he's a member of the house judiciary committee and the House Education and Labor Committee. He previously served as a member of the Virginia House of Delegates, representing the 24th District from 2002 to 2018. In the Virginia House, Klein chaired the Committee on Militia, Police, and Public Safety. Uh, prior to his election in the House of Representatives, Ben was an attorney in private practice, and from 2007 to 2013, he was Assistant Commonwealth's Attorney for Rockingham County in the city of Harrison. 
Ben also worked for Congressman Bob Goodlatte, beginning as a member of his legislative staff in 1994, and then ultimately serving as the Congressman's Chief of Staff. Ben grew up in Rockbridge County here in Virginia and is a 1990 graduate of Lexington High School. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree from Bates College and his law degree from the University of Richmond. Ben and his wife, Elizabeth, live in Botetourt County with their two daughters. Congressman Klein, thank you for joining us and welcome to our field day. Gabriel, it's great to be with you. Thank you for letting me join you. And thank you for taking a moment to remember David Fisk. He was amazing. Uh, his legacy will be felt for so many years uh, there in Rafine and, and across Virginia. Um, it's it's a, a monumental loss that uh, uh, it, it we're all struggling with, but uh, we really thought the world of him. Um, it's great to be with you guys again. I wish I were in Rafine. Uh, you know, today's virtual field day is, uh, is a testament to the resilience of the community. So I'm glad everybody's getting together on, on Zoom to, to have this event, uh, even online instead of in person. You know, it just uh, goes without saying, ag is such an important part of Virginia's economy and uh, the largest industry and economic impact of 70 billion annually. Uh, these events, uh, the AREC field days are must uh, attend events for the region and just set a course for innovation uh, in agriculture throughout the country and, and beyond. Um, you know, the vital information on ways to improve soil conditions, increase crop yields, raise healthy and stronger livestock, all of that comes from these events. And uh, I've enjoyed visiting them in the past and seeing everybody face to face. I'm just gonna have to say hi from, from, uh, for today from a virtual perspective. Um, you know, moving forward, we've got to remain competitive in the global market. Uh, it's great that we have local resources uh, through Virginia Tech available to area farmers. And I know that it's been tough times for Virginia farmers, and it's important that the Shenandoah Valley AREC continues its vital research efforts that enable farmers to increase their profits while advancing innovative farming techniques. Uh, commend the men and women who work hard every day to provide food for our nation and the world. Ag is an ever-changing industry, and by using the valuable data from research centers like Shen Valley AREC, will ensure the long-term success of rural America. So uh, I know everybody's here to get vital information, not to hear from another politician. So I'll, I'll uh, yield the floor. It's an honor to represent the farmers and producers in Virginia's 6th District. I look forward to continuing to advocate for you and your agriculture priorities in Washington. Thanks again, Gabriel. Thank you. Thanks, Congressman Klein, for joining us. We're also excited to have the Secretary of Agriculture and Forestry for the Commonwealth of Virginia here, Secretary Bettina Ring. Uh, Governor Ralph Northam appointed Bettina Ring to this position in 2018. And in this capacity, she supports the governor's mission of building a strong Virginia economy in agriculture and forestry, two of Virginia's largest private industries, while also protecting the environment. Prior to her appointment as Secretary, Ring was appointed by former Governor Terry McAuliffe to serve as the seventh state forester of the Virginia Department of Forestry. And during her term leading the agency, she secured $27 million in funding for emergency response equipment used to fight forest fires and to assist localities and other state agencies. As a Virginia native, Ring has began her career with the Department of Forestry and held a number of leadership positions, including Deputy State Forester, and uh, prior to Virginia Department of Forestry, Bettina was the Senior Vice President of Family Forest of the American Forest Foundation, a position responsible for overseeing the American tree farm system. She served on the Federal Forest Resources Coordinating Committee, which provides direction within the U.S. Department of Agriculture and with the private sector to effectively address national priorities for private forest management. Bettina also served as the executive director of the Bay Area Open Space Council in San Francisco and was the executive director of the Colorado Coalition of Land Trusts. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Forestry and Wildlife from Virginia Tech and a Master's of Business Administration from James Madison University. Secretary Ring, thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very much appreciate this opportunity and what a great kickoff with that wonderful video uh, to really set the stage. And thank you, Congressman Klein, for your leadership 
both at the state level and now at the national level. You've been a, a leader and a strong proponent and advocate for agriculture and forestry, and we're grateful. So uh, thank you for um, helping uh, kick things off today as well. I'm a, certainly a, a proud Hokie, so I'm a bit biased when it comes to talking about Virginia Tech and all the great work that's taking place there. But when we see what's happening uh, with our, our field station at, on campus at Virginia Tech and what we see happening with the AREX uh, across um, the state, and I, the video really captured it all so well. Uh, but the work that's being conducted is so critical to advancing our, our number one industry and our third largest industry. And so Congressman Klein talked about uh, the contribution of our industry here in the state with agriculture. When you combine that with forestry, and we know uh, here at McCormick Farm, you um, actually do a lot with forestry and agriculture, so I think it's important to speak to both of those. And when you combine those two industries, number one, and our third largest industry, $91 billion and close to 450,000 jobs across the Commonwealth. The research that's taking place um, on campus and across the state uh, at the centers really make a huge difference. They help advance the industry in so many ways. The technology transfer, you heard from stakeholders on the video, and, and just a, you know, a few examples of how it's really helping to advance the innovation uh, that Congressman Klein talked about, to advance technology, to make sure we're continuing to get better and better at what we do. And I think that's what's uh, really great about Virginia Tech. I think that's what's great about our, our entire industry is that we want to continue to build on our past successes. We have a strong foundation of agriculture in the state. It's our, um, you know, one of our, our first industries, really, ag and forestry, our two um, early industries in the state. So over 400 years, we've been doing this, and we know that it continues to evolve, and it will so, thanks to the good work at Virginia Tech and Virginia State University. Um, and I think what's really unique is that each center plays uh, a really um, unique role based on their focus, where they're located in the state, what the needs are of the community and the stakeholders there, and to ensure that we have diversity. We have a very diverse industry, and we wanna make sure that we're conducting research and that we're transferring that knowledge uh, across the state. And I think it's just really exciting to see uh, what takes place and what's taken place for a long time with the centers and with Virginia Tech and with Virginia State University. And I think what's really um, also another important piece of this is really how you engage students. And so having students involved at the research centers and making sure that they're, they're learning, they're learning to conduct research, they're learning how to educate and share that information as well. And so, um, you know, I think that there are many great examples out there and I have one of my own. Um, my junior year in college, I was studying forestry at Virginia Tech, I graduated from Virginia Tech, as you heard, in forestry and wildlife. And I had the opportunity to work at the Reynolds Homestead Research Station um, after my junior year. And so at the time, Richard Cray was the superintendent and Richard was, he had very high standards, as most of the superintendents um, do. And he expected a lot of us. I worked very hard, but I learned so much. So everything from shearing Christmas trees to helping with one of the first water quality and best management practice um, uh, experiments and research being done around timber harvesting. So I'm starting to age myself and date myself and sharing that information uh, to also measuring plants and to watching them grow and to, to learning um, different things that we were uh, experimenting with um, related to soils and fertilizers and so forth. And so that just really, um, it really impressed, um, had a big impression on me. It certainly helped me with my career. But I think another piece of it is that I was working side by side with grad students and I was living next door to the Cray family. So truly the work that's done in the centers, um, it's really very much like a family. Uh, for those that are working there, for those that interact and come and go, for the students that come and go. And so for myself, I stayed in touch with the Cray family for, for a long time after um, leaving the center. And I think that is what's really uh, special about them because it's that connection to the community, what the needs are, um, and, and what takes place there. And also our Assistant Secretary Heidi Hertz, who is joining us on the call today and will be participating in the duration. Um, she was actually working, she worked three summers at the Southern Piedmont AREC in Blackstone. And that had a huge impact on her career as well. 
Uh, Heidi uh, actually conducted some tobacco research while she was there. She spent a lot of time, I think, counting aphids and, and hornworms, and she worked under Dr. Chuck, Chuck Johnson and some others. Um, but I know it had a big impression, and she talks about it often um, as we share stories back in the office uh, when we're together. And Heidi went on to study um, at Virginia Tech and to focus on food and nutrition, and has spent much of her career addressing food security. So I think um, also as I look at my career, I had a strong connection to the McCormick Farm, to the Shenandoah Valley, AREC, because of the work that we were doing at the Department of Forestry in partnership with you all, the research that you were conducting there and what's taken place over time. Um, and I think you really pushed the agency, you pushed foresters as well to think differently about how we intersect with agriculture. And so Silva Pasture uh, was something that you were doing early on. And I think, you know, coming out of forestry school, sometimes you may not, you, you may want to think, okay, the cows are here and the forests are here, but we recognize that there are ways, there are new ways and improved ways of actually doing things um, in a very integrated fashion. And you'll be hearing more about that today. Uh, we're pretty fortunate in our office, I think, to um, look at, um, you know, we have many great partners that we work with. Adam Downing, uh, I've worked with for years, who's uh, going to be participating today as well. And so these partnerships are really critical. And we're pretty fortunate to have a team that's very connected to rural Virginia. So Deputy Secretary Brian Copenhaver, who could not be with us today, he grew up on a cattle farm in Southwest Virginia in Washington County. Heidi grew up in Lunenburg County, a strong connection to agriculture and forestry, especially Lunenburg County has so much going on there with, with both of those industries. And then Brandon Hatcher, who's on our team, and he grew up on a cattle farm in Buckingham County. We're also fortunate to have three great leaders uh, within our agencies. Um, we have many great leaders within the agencies, but leading those agencies. And so Dr. Joel Bernal, who is our Ag Commissioner, many of you work with, as well as our State Forester, Rob Farrell. And then the Racing Commission is in our, under our Secretariat. And we know that horse racing is very important to Virginia. Dr. Da um, David Lamond, or not Dr. David Lamond is um, the director of BRC, but we have three main priorities within our secretariat that we focus on, and that's rural economic development, it's forest and farmland retention. We know Adam's been working on that quite a bit with the Generation Next program with Jennifer Gagnon and others in the Department of Forestry, and then food security. And so when you look at the three of those, they're very much connected. If you removed any of the three, it's gonna impact the other three. And I think we realize that now more than ever with COVID. I think everyone's really recognizing and thinking about where their food comes from. We recognize that we have an increased number of folks that are impacted by COVID and impacted by not having access to healthy, nutritious foods uh, because of being unemployed, of being having um, resources stretched across the state, across the nation and the world. And so this, I think, really speaks to the importance of agriculture again, uh, the work that farmers and forest landowners are doing, and the fact that we recognized early on that these industries are essential businesses and that they needed to remain open, that we needed to keep that supply chain open across the board. So uh, when you think about it, it's true. We know that our farmers, our industries are feeding the world. And so that's um, so evident now, and I think uh, people do not take that for granted. And so whether you're a research scientist, a policymaker, an administrator, a farmer, a banker, um, some of the sponsors that were mentioned earlier, everyone plays a role in this industry. Everyone plays a role in the supply chain and making sure that we keep that supply chain open. And we know we've had some disruptions in that supply chain because of COVID. So it really takes all of us working together um, and recognizing that every piece is essential. Um, the grocery stores, thinking about uh, the forest products industry, I think we recognize um, how important, um, certainly having access to uh, paper towels <laughs> when we're dealing with the pandemic, um, all of the other paper products such as toilet paper, looking at uh, sustainable packaging. And I Virginia Tech does a lot of research around sustainable packaging. And now with many of us having products and services you know, we, we really rely on that uh, packaging to ensure that we're keeping everyone safe and that we're being able to ship products. And then how connected we are when you look at the fact that we, um, our poultry industry relies on shavings from our sawmill industry. And as we were really starting to move into the pandemic and not knowing what was going to happen, 
it was really, we were starting to hear from both the sawmills and the poultry industry that we needed to make sure that there weren't disruptions on either end because they're so um, connected and uh, really dependent upon each other. And so I think it really is important that um, we recognize how interdependent we are as we move forward, as we think about how we're approaching things. We're certainly in a very unprecedented time, a very challenging time, but we know that our farmers have been through challenging times before. And I think Congressman Klein mentioned this earlier, um, our farmers are resilient, our industry, our forest landowners are resilient. So we keep bouncing back, we keep finding positive ways um, to move forward together. When you think about all of the folks that are participating today, I know you have many beef cattle farmers that are on the call when you look at the program agenda, uh, which is fantastic. We know it hasn't been easy for, for our farmers and especially um, our beef cattle farmers because markets have not been the same as they were in the past. Uh, we know that expenses are up. Uh, we know that there can be many challenges um, and that Often we're asking more of you as it relates to land stewardship. We're asking that you put more conservation practices in and sometimes that the funding hasn't been there for those practices. So you're having to invest more in your land. And we recognize uh, that that's a challenge. I think we're pleased that Governor Northam has devoted really historic amounts of funding for ag BMPs and we were hopeful uh, before the pandemic hit, uh, hit that we were gonna be able to do even more. But now we, we recognize the economy has been impacted and we're going to have to do some new projections and reassess things, but we're going to do everything we can to try to keep that funding as high as possible and that we keep as many tools in the toolbox for our farmers as possible uh, to ensure that we're able to continue to uh, do the very best we can, taking care of our lands, taking care of the environment, taking care of the economy and our communities. And Virginia Tech is contributing so much again uh, because of the great research that's being done and that technology transfer that's taking place through our extension agents and others. And so I just want to, um, in closing, just um, thank you again for giving me the opportunity to be with you today. You have a tremendous agenda ahead of you, and so I don't want to take any more of your time, uh, but I just want to remind you that we never forget the fact that you are so critical to the economy here in Virginia, all of us working together, it really is uh, essential that we continue to do so and that we support each other and we are feeding the world and that's something to be very, very proud of. And we know that there's gonna be increased demand on that for a while and uh, we're gonna continue to be, be challenged in many ways. But I think it's really important um, to remember that we are resilient and by leaning on each other, we will get through this. Um, I hope that you stay healthy and that you stay safe and that you enjoy your time together and you learn and you take that the learnings back home um, and share those with your neighbors. So thank you again. Thank you, Secretary Ring. It's great to have you here. Appreciate you joining us. Uh, and now uh, with that, we're ready to begin highlighting the projects that have taken place here at the AREC over the past few years. We're going to start off with a project that I've had the pleasure of working on with Mr. Adam Downing and Dr. John Fike in our civil pasture as um, Secretary Ring mentioned earlier here at the farm. Uh, I will remind you, please submit your questions as you think of them through the question and answer uh, function at the bottom of your screen. Agroforestry describes a set of management practices in which elements of agriculture and forestry are incorporated on the same unit of land. Silvopasture, pasture in particular involves the opportunity to grow forestry timber, non-timber forest products, as well as forage understory so that we can get the benefits of shade for our livestock, mitigating erosion issues in some sites. We also have the opportunity to incorporate more carbon back into the system. And then it also provides for wildlife habitats. The site that I'm standing on is a degraded timber stand that was here. It was actually part of an old homestead. And so we went through with a forester and selected those trees that we wanted to leave. The rest of the understory was cleaned out. Our next job was to broadcast seed a number of cool season species in the understory. Those included endophyte free tall fescue, orchard grass, a smooth brome grass, meadow fescue, perennial ryegrass, as well as some bluegrass. Orchard grass does well with shade. Fescue does okay, and smooth brome does well under shade as well. 
The Orsori had some good trees, uh, some of which you see behind me, some hickory, some black walnut. Another species that was on this stand was white ash. It's a good tree for silver pasture reasons. In 2017, we noticed evidence of the emerald ash borer. Uh, so there was really no choice on this site than to remove those trees. That left us with a situation of not really having enough trees here. So can we plant trees and have them protected in a way that allow livestock still to utilize the site? And the answer we think is yes. This is a arbor shield and it has barbs on it, very much like a barbed wire. All right, it has three uh, rebars to hold it in place and it's doing a fine job. It is not pleasant to work with and it is also not cheap. On this side of me, we have the fixed knot. This is basically a tomato cage, also with three rebars holding it in place. The other is a tree tube. This is a Tubex brand. There are other brands. An advantage of these, generally speaking, is that it's like a greenhouse effect, so the tree does shoot up faster. But for the most part, these did not do well at all. They have not stood up to the pressure from the cattle. And the fourth is simply planting a tree with no protection at all. And I bet you can guess what happened to those. They're not there. I want to share with you a little bit again about the species that we planted. Uh, one is red oak. It has potential timber value and black locust. It's a fast growing tree, has a good kind of shade, and it also improves the site by fixing nitrogen. We also planted pine trees because of the kind of diffusion of light that they let through and they're fast growing. And just for fun, we also planted some American chestnut. The first column you'll see status, or if the black locust was alive. And in the case of the tree tubes, a lot of that was missing here on this last round. And then the third column is browse damage. And the locust is very evident with that. It's also a species that is a preferred browse. And the overall picture that we're seeing is that there is browse pressure, but that the pressure does not seem to be detrimental to the overall health of the tree. But now let's look at red oak. And again, we have these three same columns. Is it alive? Are they damaged or missing? And then the browse damage. The cheapest method for tree protection was this tube. This added up to about $4. The next most cost-effective option was the fixed knot. That's about $8. And it seems to work pretty well. And the Arbor Shield adds up to about $25. And so quite a difference in price, and we don't see a lot of difference in functionality between the Arbor Shield and the Fixed Knot. Well, thank you, uh, Adam and John, for that video. And now I see you're both uh, joined with your video on and ready to answer some questions. The first question that we have and in our box is, um, can you use T-posts instead of rebars? Um, Adam, do you wanna take a stab at that question first? I don't see why not. Rebar is probably cheaper. All right, thanks. And uh, if there are any other questions, please uh, just type them there into your question and answer box. I do have a question for John. Um, you didn't get much on the seeding of the forges themselves, but can you just remind us how the, the forges were seeded and, and what you did to make that successful? <clears throat> this is a really uh, kind of a rough site. There are a number of rock ridges that run through it, and so it would have been difficult to use standard um, drill type uh, planting technology. So we went back to the predecessor of the drill technology, uh, and we used a broadcast uh, seeder. And we put in uh, a little higher rate than what we would do with open field or uh, with a drill uh, type of planting situation. I'm trying to remember, I think in the aggregate, we had probably 30 pounds to the acre of seed, uh, which would have been across several of those uh, cool season grass species. We also added a little bit of um, cereal rye to help get a little quicker uh, cover. And uh, one of the things that that was done on part of the site, we had some mulching in those sites where there was a little bit of mulch layer, but, but not too much. I mean, I think that's a, a, an issue. If you get too much carbon, you can prevent uh, nutrient 
or reduce nutrient availability to a young seedling. But in this case, a little bit of mulch there helped kind of protect the ground, gave a kind of a niche for seed to fall into and get some soil uh, seed contact and that helped with establishment. One other thing I'd like to mention about tubes, we, we have some thoughts that there may be some other ways to use tree tubes and put some protection with the tree tube that would uh, give us the advantage of the habitat or environment that the tube creates um, and it keeps it protected. But we're not yet at a place where we can study that just yet. So, but I think that there may be uh, even better, cheaper ways to get trees in place. All right, thank you. Uh, we've got a number of other questions just came in. Uh, Adam, would you just briefly um, re remark on tree spacing? And, and yeah, so that's a good question. Um, start like so many answers. It depends on species that you're choosing. Some trees are gonna spread wider than others. Um, it also depends on how you wanna manage it. So if you want to uh, get some uh, quicker closure, um, then you could go with a thinner spacing, but um, a simple start to that answer would be no closer than 20 feet to each other because the trees are gonna be competing with each other. And so you uh, wanna space it out really uh, quite a bit more than that uh, to allow for the forage. Um, it really does depend on the tree species and the type of shade that is getting through those crowns and in between those crowns. So with oaks, you're not going to have as you're going to have fewer trees than you would say with um, with a black locust. I'd like to comment on that if I can. Some of that probably depends on where you're planting. Uh, for example, Gabriel did his research on a site that was planted with trees every eight feet apart in a row. And then those rows were 40 feet apart. So, you know, depending on how you want to configure them and what you've got to plant, you might put trees in place that um, would coppice well. So you might cut them off at some point and they come back uh, later. Uh, so some people might do that with locusts for firewood or things like that. And, and you get the benefit of the, the tree effects on each other and some of the tree benefits relative to shade for young animals. But, but recognize too that that's a, you've, you're gonna have to have a management strategy for thinning those trees out over time. And it's kind of a long-term process. Thank you both. Um, if you, I believe you both can type answers into the additional questions. So if you could maybe work on those um, and then folks can read those as they pop up, we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next video. Um, this is on an unusual project taking place here at the AREC. Uh, this involves dual use pasture systems for cows and pollinators. And this video has been put together by Dr. Ben Tracy. The premise of this study is to construct a biodiverse pasture that has a mixture of native warm season grasses and native wildflowers. The native grasses are warm season grasses and they're very productive forage for beef cattle in the summertime. And the wildflowers provide a habitat and increased resources uh, for pollinators, particularly bees, which have been declining. One thing I've learned about bees is that they tend to have plenty of resources in the spring and early summer, but the mid and late summer is when the blooms kind of die down and flowering trees are not as abundant. And so having a pasture where we have a lot of blooms available for bees may really benefit. We planted with a mixture of three native warm season grasses, Indian grass, big blue stem, a little blue stem, and a mix of uh, nine different uh, wildflower species. And as you can see right now, this field is primarily dominated by two wildflowers, the gray-headed coneflower and Maximilian sunflower. And in addition to native wildflowers, one idea is that not killing all of your thistles may be actually kind of beneficial, at least for pollinators. What we planted was basically about a 50-50 ratio of wildflower seed to native grass seed. And in that kind of situation, what we found is that the wildflowers kind of outcompeted. While we had plenty of wildflowers for bees, we didn't have enough native grass forage for beef cattle. You probably have to have a much higher ratio of native grass to wildflower, uh, probably like a 75 to 25 kind of ratio. And one of the things we're looking at is finding out what's gonna be beneficial to both cattle and bees. We actually killed all the existing tall fescue vegetation in the spring of 2016. 
and then planted a cover crop of barley in the fall. But that was used for grazing. We sprayed all that again, and then we planted this mixture of native grasses and wildflowers the first week of June in 2017. Right now we're in the June uh, 2020, and so this is the third full season. Last year we planted about a third of an acre here mixture of native grasses and wildflowers. We had terrific weed pressure. You know, rather than to replant the entire thing, we actually just sprayed this plot with uh, a Mazepic or a Plateau probably about two weeks ago. You can kind of see here the, these bunches of grasses. These are some of the uh, big blue stem and Indian grass and little blue stem. The natives are gonna continue uh, to grow. And what we're going to do here in the fall is overseed our wildflower mix into the established native grass uh, stand here. And then uh, next year we will begin actually grazing. So comparing three different grazing scenarios, you know, the native grasses to a shade structure and then also compare it to just straight tall fescue. And the reason for the shade is that one of the things that fescue does, it reduces the capacity of cattle to cool themselves. And we think that if they're allowed to graze these native grasses in the summertime, that will help alleviate that problem and improve their overall health and weight gain. So comparing you know, the native grasses to a shade structure, which theoretically should help cool the animals, that's the premise of the study. Thanks, Ben, for that. Thank you for joining us. Um, again, if you have questions for Dr. Ben Tracy, please type them in the question and answer box. Uh, I have a question that came up asking about rotating or continuous. So I guess this is probably a question about stocking management on these types of pastures. Ben, could you speak to that? You know, explicitly, we're not really looking at um, comparing rotational versus continuous grazing of these uh, pastures. Uh, but uh, we think that a rotational uh, type method would probably work better. Um, you know, going in there, uh, grazing these pastures for a short amount of time, and then, um, you know, getting the cattle off there uh, should kind of be an optimal way to, to, to graze these. All right, thanks. Um, it, also, I'm curious about the species that you've worked with, um, the three-way mixture that you mentioned, Indian grass, big blue stem, and little blue stem. What are the advantages of those versus um, other species, other native grass species? Right, well, we use, we use these three a lot um, for several reasons. One is that uh, they work pretty well in a grazing uh, situation, particularly the little blue stem and Indian grass tend to be a little shorter statured. Um, and the cattle seem to be able to graze those uh, and, and seem to prefer them. The other major native warm season grass that maybe a lot of you've heard about is switchgrass. And switchgrass is a good one to use, but it's very uh, competitive, uh, tends to really uh, dominate pastures. And it also tends to uh, be more productive uh, earlier in the season when we, are, we actually have a lot of cool season forages available. The other main, main advantage of the th these three species that I mentioned briefly in the video is that they're resistant to this herbicide uh, plateau or mazepic. And that, and using these three species, and it gives you a little bit more flexibility with, with herbicides uh, to use that and helping with establishment. There's also a question that came up, and you might comment on this briefly and then maybe add a more detailed response in the, the box, but the question was, do you have a general seeding recipe or recommendation for the native grass and wildflowers? Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question, and that's really something that we are uh, looking at. I mean, this video really deals with uh, the first step of this whole bee-friendly beef sort of concept. Uh, really just doing kind of a, some demonstration uh, projects at field scale. And what we're working on now is looking at uh, different ways of establishing uh, uh, wildflowers and, and trying to find 
you know, what do you, what do you really need to do in terms of getting an optimal balance of, of native grasses to wildflowers and which wildflowers um, uh, kind of work best for, for our region uh, as well. So that's really kind of the second part of this. All right, well, thank you. So next up, we've got a, a video on a third project. Um, this involves a particularly vital nutrient for livestock this time of year, and that is uh, water. And this project is on, uh, or solar powered watering. Standing here in a pasture near Swope, Virginia, this pasture is on a short-term year-to-year lease. The farmer was interested in options to exclude cattle from the stream here, uh, but then also that created some challenges to find an alternative water source. This issue led to an ongoing project to explore solar-powered water pumping systems. Now the ideal situation is to have a year-round system, the lines buried, for freeze protection. Now on year-to-year -year leases or short-term leases, uh, sometimes that's not an option. These systems can be an alternative for farmers to consider to provide water where they need it during the freeze-free months. With the support of project sponsors, we've been able to set up different on-farm demonstration systems to assess system performance and also understand farmer experiences in operating these systems. One of the demonstration projects was installed late spring 2020 at the Shenandoah Valley AREG. The rest of this presentation will focus on experiences with that system. Now here's some footage of the demonstration system at the Shenandoah Valley AREC. The solar array that you see are six 100 watt panels for a 600 watt solar array mounted on a pole. On the pole is a system controller. This system controller regulates the energy that's applied to a submersible pump in that pond that pumps water to the trough, which is about 650 gallon storage. Once that trough is full, a float valve closes and the pump pumps water towards the top of the hill where there is a system reservoir of about 2,250 gallons. Unique to this system is the 1,000 gallon collapsible onion tank. The onion tank folds up much like a tent for easier relocation. And the other is the addition of energy storage in a small battery bank. They don't actually need a battery bank. We can just pump water up the hill and then gravity flow off of that. However, we often receive a lot of questions with interest and battery prices have come down dramatically over the past few years. In this scenario, the batteries store energy. So when there isn't sufficient solar resource, the batteries can provide power to the solar pump. So in a way we have energy storage both in batteries and in the capacity of the reservoir at the top of the hill to then gravity flow to supply water to that trough. Now let's hear from Gabe regarding some of their experiences with the initial use of this system. I'm standing in one of our pasture systems here at the farm. This is around 140 acres in size. It's split up into about six different paddocks, roughly 20 acres or so. And we generally run about 40 to 60 fall calving brood cows on these paddocks. One of the pastures, however, is 45 acres in size. So it's a much larger pasture and it only has one watering source in the entire paddock. What we have traditionally done is we split this pasture in half because we only have one watering source, it creates a heavy use site around that water, creating mud and wallowing holes. It also creates heavy use sites along the shade, and it also creates ruts in the lane as the animals travel back and forth to get to water. The second problem, utilization by the cows of forage in these far corners of the large pasture is not very good. And we have seen this anecdotally here, but we've also seen data, particularly from the University of Missouri, showing that forage utilization within the first few hundred feet of a watering source may be as good as 40 to 50 percent. But as soon as you get about 1,100 feet away from watering source, forage utilization decreases all the way down to 20 percent. And so these two problems led us to a solar watering system. We've got a pond strategically located in the middle of this 45 acre pasture. It's fenced off so the animals don't have access to it, but there's an opportunity for us to pump water out of that pond up on the hillside behind me so that animals can drink out of it when they're in that second paddock. We now have water within just a few hundred feet of any site within this pasture. We still put up the lane to allow them to have access to the first paddock during the first rotation. But what I noticed is that the cows just didn't go back. 
and the solar powered watering system has met their needs even in these hot, dry days. Thanks, John and Matt, and uh, also Austin Horn for your support with this uh, project. I do want to note to everyone that John wanted me to follow up uh, with a poll to see if anyone was interested in learning more about this topic. So I'm going to launch a poll now. If you would, uh, please respond whether you're interested in learning more, and then I'll get this email list to, to John to follow up with if you're interested in this topic. Starting off, John, we've got a question. Um, what is the likelihood of these water system components being approved by NRCS and DCR for use in cost share programs? Well, I think that depends on the, the application. Now, the NRCS programs, I think they're designed for uh, year-round uh, permanent systems, uh, whereas I think the system that we demoed in this video is an application for the freeze-free months. So many of the same components, if installed for year-round use, uh, should fit into existing NRCS uh, programs uh, through, uh, through, say, EQIP or through even some of the uh, programs with rural development, the uh, Rural Energy for America program uh, grant on the solar aspect. Uh, but a caveat would be that the, the demo that we showed here is for use in freeze-free months, uh, primarily targeted on, on applications on rented ground. All right, thanks. Anything you want to add, Matt? Uh, we've got, just to mention, we've got quite a few sites out under varying conditions and, you know, they all, they've all got their issues, but for the most part, it's worked pretty well and you can, you can adapt it to a lot of different conditions. One thing to, to make note of is you, you still have to keep an eye on it and check on it every few days, just like any system. Thanks, Matt and John. And uh, I will note that of those that have responded to the poll, uh, almost 90% have want some follow-up information. So uh, I'll get the email list to you soon, John. All right, next up, we've got a video featuring herbicide products that may help you keep your electric fence hot and well-maintained. When you have a summer stockpile, you're going through a lot of residue to string your electric fence. You can see a lot of seed heads to the potential of grounding out the uh, fence or having difficulty in running your line. But there are several herbicides labeled for growth suppression, particularly seed head suppression of tall fescue. So we're here on the Shendo Valley AREC looking at several of those herbicides in strips where we intend to put the electric fast fence. The materials we ended up using were Plateau, which is a Mazepic at two ounces per acre, Met Sulfuron at a half ounce per acre, and then Chaparral at two ounces per acre. The treatment was applied April 7th this year. The labels recommend that you have at least six inches of growth before joint stage. This year, the treatment was made early in April. Uh, some of my past work, it's been mid to late April. With the treatments, we just strung a fast fence from fence post to fence post to keep a straight line, utilized a backpack sprayer calibrated at 34 gallons per acre and treated with a three foot band. This is a representative view of a check plot that received no herbicide treatment whatsoever. We can see a multitude of seed heads here. The majority of them are tall fescue. So this is one of the chaparral treatments. It was applied at two ounces per acre. Uh, it does a decent job of suppressing the tall fescue seed heads, but it's not real consistent. You can see a tall fescue clump right here in front of me that's in the middle of the plot. And then right behind me, it's very clean. It does not do a good job of picking up orchard grass and bluegrass. This is an example of plateau at two ounces per acre. You can see it gives a pretty good suppression of the seed heads. We are seeing activity on orchard grass and bluegrass in addition to the tall fescue. The yield is lower. Initial injury was a little greater with the plateau. This treatment probably worked the best of the ones in this study. And sulfuron was applied at a half ounce per acre. 
the label precautions using more than 0.4 ounces per acre on tall fescue because you can get significant injury. There was injury on these plots at three weeks after treatment. They have grown out of it pretty well at this point. It has minimal impact on orchard grass and bluegrass. The plateau plot, which is illustrated here, showed a 77% decrease in fresh weight uh, eight weeks after treatment. Metsulfuron yielded a 71% reduction, while the Caparel plot gave 33% reduction. The cost for this type of utilization is relatively cheap. Metsulfuron runs about $1.36 per mile of fence line. The Plateau ran $1.66, and the Chaparral was $4.65 per mile. I envision being able to utilize an ATV sprayer, especially if you have the boomless sprayer with a three nozzle system, shut off the outside two nozzles. Another option with the ATV would be to take the handgun outfitted with a flat fan nozzle, angle it such that it's giving a nice three to four foot band behind the sprayer. It should be minimal effort on your part. Doug. Uh, if you have questions for Doug, uh, go ahead and submit them into the question and answer uh, box. Uh, you might remember Doug being here a couple of years back talking about some additional uh, fence line suppression techniques. Uh, Doug, I'm just wondering if have you tried this on a larger scale at all? Um, you mentioned putting it on a four wheel and running it. Have you, have you tried anything? No, I haven't tried it on a large scale. My initial work was done on, on uh, permanent high tensile fencing. So I was using a handgun uh, at about 80 gallons per acre, uh, treating a band on each side of the fence. Uh, I'm looking at it, uh, some uh, Imazepic for uh, stilt grass control. And so I'm treating uh, one and 2000 square foot blocks. Uh, again, with backpack sprayer, but it, it is uh, working pretty good. We also have a question. When you say growth suppression, do you mean of the grass or just the seed head? Actually, it, it ends up being both. Um, the data presented was fresh weight, so it would be the combination of uh, leaf tissue and seed heads and weeds. The seed head reduction is what we were after to keep it out of the fence line. We also have a question. Did you test current on any of the fence lines in the various plots? Uh, no, that issue has come up and I'm, I'm not sure of a good way to test that, but uh, the goal will be to uh, graze that this fall. So we are open to suggestions of how to measure that uh, as part of the uh, data collection. All right, thanks, Doug. There's a few more questions if you don't mind uh, answering those using the, the um, text option. No problem, thanks a lot. All right, uh, continuing on the herbicide theme, we've got another video this time from Dr. Michael Flesner. We all know that weeds are things that we don't want. They reduce our yield, they can reduce the quality of that yield, and can actually be poisonous or injurious to some of our animals, uh, and of course they're unsightly. So we manage weeds in a few different ways, uh, whether that's mowing or herbicide application, but really our best weed management tool is to have a strong, vigorous stand of grass. We really don't have herbicides on the market that can give us good weed control without also killing a clovers in our stand, which of course are very valuable. So this puts a lot of us in a, a position where we can either spray the herbicide and kill the weeds, or we have to keep the weeds and we also get to keep our clover. And so there's a trade-off there. So we've been fortunate to work with Corteva and test a new product called ProClovo. And we have really seen good weed control in our pastures while preserving white clover. There is some injury that occurs. You'll see it kind of just lay over for four to five weeks, but then it stands right back up and recovers. And the length of that recovery is really just depending on growing conditions at the time. If it's not safe to red clover, then we'll take those out of the stand. And so we need to make sure we identify whether we have white or red clover in our pastures. And some of the common weeds that we've seen could controlled really well are buttercups, ragweeds, 
pigweeds. It does tend to be a little bit weaker on some of the tough to control perennials like milkweeds, hemp dogbane, as well as the woody perennials. So it's gonna have a fit, I think, in more of a high quality maintenance role, but it's not gonna be that tool that brings us back from a disaster. Clover is scheduled to get EPA approval the fourth quarter of this year, so I'm hopeful it'll be on the market in January 2021. Corteva also has a new herbicide that is currently on the market called Duracor. Duracor is essentially a shift from Grazon Next. They both contain amino pyrolid, so very similar weed control. Duracor is going to pick up a couple extra weeds, uh, such as plantains and some of the carrots, like poison hemlock and wild carrot. Duracor will kill your clovers, whether they're white or red, but it is a more powerful herbicide. So if we have those tough to control perennials, that's still, I think, going to be the go-to to really kind of reach back and then pull back Mother Nature. Duracor and Raison Next have the same level of residual activity in the soil. Uh, and so if you wanted to reseed clover after a Duracor application, you'd either want to do that starting in the fall after a spring application, or you'd want to wait until the next spring after a late summer application. Several co-ops in the area have started to offer uh, dry fertilizer impregnated applications. And so they take the herbicide, put it on the fertilizer, and they spread that across the field. I think that's really a win-win for a lot of us because the, the co-ops are set up to cover more acres that way so they can get across more ground. And it also saves the, the producer that application cost of having to apply both a, a fertilizer and a herbicide. We've seen it and from the co-ops I've talked to some actually very good results from this but I think producers should really look closely at weeds they have in the field to make sure that's going to be the right timing for them. The best time to apply your fertilizer may or may not be the best time to apply for the weeds you have in your field. So an example of that would be a weed such as horse nettle. Our best time to apply a herbicide for horse nettle is really in July at full flowering, whereas our best time to apply a fertilizer is going to be more like March. So whatever your weed management issue is uh, in your pastures and hay fields, uh, Extension has a lot of resources to help you tackle that weed problem, whether it's weed identification, uh, publications to help you figure out what is the best way to manage that weed, uh, as well as your local agent. So best of luck with the rest of the season and fighting those pesky weeds. Dr. Plessner. Uh, a few questions here, Michael, on, on weed control. Um, first one is, is Pro Clover okay with Durana Clover? Yeah, so uh, Durana Clover is a, a variety of white clover, and so that's really, it's, it's the species uh, of white clover that, that it's safe to, as well as annual espadiza. But like I mentioned in the video, uh, the other legume species, including red clover, uh, it will kill those and or severely take those out of the stand. So uh, definitely need to be careful which uh, species of clover we have and knowing which variety you, your um, or, or what species your variety falls into is important there. All right, thanks. Uh, also, another question was how effective can periodic mowing uh, at a, a high height be versus herbicide? Yeah, so that, that's a, a, a good question and kind of a common one on the using a mower versus a, a herbicide. To, to get effective weed control with mowing, the timing is, is really critical, um, even more so than with, with the herbicide. So you really want to try to exhaust any underground um, structures of, of energy that they have stored in them, whether that's a bulb or a tuber or a root, depending on the weed species. And so generally, if you mow right at when you first just start to see flower buds emerging, that's when that underground structure uh, has depleted most of its energy. And so if you can continually do that, um, you could be effective uh, with weed control and mowing. Uh, that is, is mow it off. Once you see the regrowth get back to about that same stage, mow it off again. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of times it just cleans it up for a couple weeks and, and then that, that, that plant comes back. And so I think there's good reasons to mow a pasture, uh, but weed control is, is usually sort of mediocre. Uh, in terms of that. So I, I generally prefer a good systemic herbicide that's going to move down into those underground plant tissues and, and hopefully kill those versus trying to mow them off. And, and there is a cost to mowing too that I don't think is well accounted for sometimes that we need to acknowledge. Thanks, Dr. Plessner. There's one more question there on perilla mint. If you don't mind typing in an answer to that, what herbicides work well on perilla? 
All right, next up, uh, we've got a video on summer stockpile tall fescue pastures again. Uh, this is from Dr. Bain Wilson. <laughs> Typical forage management in our cool season uh, tall fescue pastures is that fescue goes through a summer slump. Oftentimes, uh, producers work all summer to harvest hay, and then they're feeding that hay to get through the late summer. And we feel that there's got to be a more economical option to carry our cow herd through that late summer period. Summer stockpiling, it helps bridge the gap in between summer grazing as well as fall stockpiling. Uh, typically from August to October, providing producers an additional 60 to 90 days that they're allowing cattle to graze without having additional supplementation. Historically, we've allocated 25% of total available pasture to set aside through mid-July. During this time frame, those cattle will continue to graze at the 75%. Once we reach mid-July, we then start setting aside an additional 25% of pastures for fall stockpiling. From there, we continue to graze cattle on the remaining 50%, and as we get ready to rotate into summer stockpiling from August to October, we then allow for those 60 to 90 days for that pasture to accumulate. That way, as we bridge the gap, cattle are having plenty of readily available forage and be useful in production. Kind of additional part of the project that we uh, looked at was the different cultivars of tall fescue that we have planted here at Shenandoah Valley ARET. As with most uh, farms in the southeastern United States, we have traditional Kentucky 31 tall fescue that we know performance losses associated with the extra time spent in shade and water, the reduced average daily gain, and lower milk production. There's been quite a bit of research in the last 20 to 30 years to come up with improved cultivars of tall fescue and the one that we evaluate is Max-Q, a novel endophyte fescue that has seen improvements in average daily gain while also having the advantages of traditional Kentucky 31. We examined 128 cattle from August 31st to October 24th. Cattle were strip grazed without a back wire with forage allocated every three or four days. At the conclusion of our study, there were no differences in forage mass between tall fescue pastures. Uh, with both producing roughly 5,300 to 7,500 pounds per acre. We also saw consistency in the total argon alkaloid production for Kentucky 31 with levels above 1,000 parts per billion, which is more likely to show clinical signs of fescue toxicosis. When looking at nutritive value, we saw a reduction for ADF and NDF as a percentage of dry matter for Kentucky 31. However, we felt these differences were minimal when considering animal performance. And then as we studied both TDN and crude protein, we saw that a crude protein range for both cultivars is relative to what we would see in excellent hay found in Virginia. In terms of animal performance, we saw no differences in cow and calf body weight, cow body condition score, as well as calf average daily gain. We saw no differences in artificial pregnancies, as well as natural service post AI. It's important to keep in mind that in our 52-day study, cows were pre-exposed to Kentucky 31, and then before reproduction, cows were co-mingled again back on Kentucky 31 tall fescue. In difference with our initial hypothesis, we did see a difference in terms of milk production with an increase for Kentucky 31 cattle. More research is needed to explain these differences in a summer stockpiled system. We view the implications of the study to mean that if we're in a situation that we have limited amounts of novel endophyte pastures, we don't necessarily have to graze these pastures during that summer slump period. We can be more flexible throughout the year. Thanks, Bain. Good to have you here. To start us off, I guess I'm, I'm curious, uh, what your next steps are and what you're curious um, and looking at following this study related to summer stockpile or, or in the fight? Yeah, it's a very good question, Gabe. And uh, so I think uh, what our goal here was to really kind of serve to benchmark uh, this production system and how it works in, uh, in at kind of in the Shenandoah Valley ARAC because it's been implemented for many years. And uh, 
really by David Fisk, and that was done without any kind of supplementation. And I think our results, you know, you kind of see that we didn't have any difference between the pesky cultivars there. Um, but I think um, if you look at our cow uh, body weight and body condition score, we did have some body condition score losses kind of from the initial part of that summer stockpile period through the our pre-breeding weights. And I guess I I would be interested to see if maybe like supplementation would be a way to kind of maintain that a little bit, maybe keep those cows uh, just a little bit better shape uh, going into breeding. All right, thanks. Um, I imagine more questions will keep popping in if, if you don't, if you're still around for a little bit, uh, keep an eye on the, the box uh, and answer them as they come up. Uh, Tom Stanley just did submit a question. Is it reasonable to expect in improved hay meadow of orchard grass and clover stockpiled until August 1st be superior in grazing than tall fescue. So that's, uh, he's just wondering if species differences would, would cause any effect, orchard grass and clover versus tall fescue mm -hmm. in the summer stockpile scenario. So, and, you know, and I think these pastures that we use in our study, like many pastures you'll find, they were not a pure monoculture of uh, tall fescue. And actually in, in a couple of our forage systems that we used, we had quite a bit of orchard grass. Uh, actually to the point that, that Dr. Pent uh, did some uh, some methods there to kind of look at that um, forage composition there. We don't have that in our video here, but um, I still think the the quality would be would be extremely high. Uh, if you look at that forage sward, you know, the, the upper portion of that was a lot of brown, maybe kind of dead material, but it, it really goes without saying or until you kind of see it, how much green growth is really underneath that forage sward. And, I think that would be true regardless of species. All right, thanks, Bain. Good to have you here. All right, thank you. All right, next up, we've got a presentation on a project that took place in our feedlot. We're here today to talk about a project we did the past couple of years um, on feedlot nutrition here at the Shenandoah Valley ARAC. The feed additives allow us to improve growth, feed efficiency, productivity, and profitability of the feedlot system. The most common one is monency, but there is a lot of other kind of feed additives. This is derived products are natural feed additives. Both monency and these derived products improving the ruminal efficiency and this is going to improve the feed efficiency and the profitability of the system. Our objective in this research was to evaluate the impact of including each derived product in a finishing diet and how these affect or not the performance, physiological response and carcass quality. In our experimental design we use a total of 89 steers that we classify by body weight and then we assign to one of two treatments. One treatment that includes the yeast derived products and other treatment without the yeast derived products. The animals in both treatments receive monensin mix in the diet. The experimental period was around 130 days and we made this research in two different periods. One that start in November 2017 and the second one that it finished in November 2018. The measurements that we took were the body weight of the animals at the beginning, middle, and at the end of the experiment. Also, at the same moment, we took blood samples and the food intake of each animal individually. To measure the individual feed intake, we used this Calangate system, where the animal is going to use this key located here as a necklace and it's going to allow to open just one gate. This allows us to have the feed intake of each animal. It was a typical feedlot diet with a 78% concentrate. The average daily gain was the same for both treatments. We also couldn't find any difference in dry matter intake. The feed efficiency was the same for both treatments. There is no difference in all of the characteristics that we measure. Hot weight, lamonchisimus area, marbling, and the percentage classified as premium and choice. So maybe the use of the monensin doesn't allow to show the potential of the yeast derived product in this finishing diet. 
but we found a tendency to increase the expression of plasma aptoglobin in the treatment that includes the derived product. This is associated with the immune system of the animal. It could be associated to an inflammatory process or an improvement of the immune system of the animal due to the yeast derived product. So it could be a possibility in animals under stress. In a future, it could be important to evaluate this yeast derived product as a substitute of the monensin. This feed additive is a natural one instead of the monensin that is an antibiotic used as a growth promoter. Also, it could be important to determine the effect of this yeast derived product in the immune system of the animals under stress conditions and in the rumen efficiency. All right, thanks, uh, Stephanie and Dr. Mercadante. Uh, Vitor, are you? Vitor is yes. joining us live. Hey, I see you now. Hey, um, I'll wait for some questions to come in on, on this video, but I, I did have a question on the project. Stephanie mentioned the product may be helpful when the cattle are under some sorts of stress conditions. What type of stress do you speculate would this product help with? I mean, is it a immunological or a environmental or what, what type of stress would that mean? Sure. Um, you know, feedlot cattle are usually under a couple different stress uh, stressors, right? Um, those can be changes in diet, for example. So when they're transitioning to a the high uh, concentrate diet, you know, that can definitely cause a stress. Uh, they have immunological responses. Um, and then two of the most common ones, are, uh, the transportation, either to the feedlot or after um, the feedlot is it's done, the finishing phase is done, and they're going to a slaughter facility. Um, and as well as weighing, uh, every time we weigh those animals, there's definitely a, a stress response and animals usually get off feed, for example. Um, so, you know, we see the, the possibility of using that uh, the feed additive strategically during some portions of the finishing period, for example, pre-shipping or right at the time that we receive those animals or around the time when we know those animals will be managed more frequently uh, to try to reduce the, the negative effects that that uh, stressor uh, could cause uh, on the immunity response of the animal, as well as some regular physiological responses that lead to the animals being off feed, uh, which are never uh, good uh, in the feedlot that will reduce performance of those animals. Thanks, uh, I got one more question. How do you measure immune system improvement? Sure. Um, you know, there's some markers um, that are, so anytime the animal has a immune response, uh, there's physiological markers. Uh, so uh, some of the most common ones we call acute phase proteins, proteins which are proteins that are produced during uh, a uh, immunological response. Uh, so there's things like seroplasmin, uh, haptoglobin, for example, are the two ones that we measure uh, on these studies. Um, and, and, and those proteins, they will spike in the blood, and that increasing concentration of those proteins are an indicator that those animals are going through an inflammatory response. Uh, they are going through a stress. Uh, the good thing about those markers is that the animal doesn't, sometimes doesn't need to show uh, symptoms, right? It's not necessarily you have a fever or, uh, you know, the animal is prost prostrated or, you know, not eating, uh, but you, it, that doesn't mean that they didn't have an immunological response. So those proteins are very sensitive. It can help us determine um, if those uh, responses happen, right? If that immune system was activated. So they're, they're really good markers for, for that. All right. Thanks, Vitor. Uh, next up, we are finished with our uh, video recorded presentations, and we're actually going to do some, some live presentations now, uh, starting with Dr. Mercadante and also Dr. Robin White. Um, both Robin and Vitor have some projects that they're planning uh, for the future related to the Virginia Tech Smart Farm Innovation Network, and so I asked them to speak a little bit to what they've got planned. 
And I tried being out here in the pasture to, to highlight some of the challenges that involved uh, precision animal agriculture. So hopefully the connection stays on and, and uh, you know, it, we don't highlight that so much. Um, but I'm, I'm here and, and later on, uh, Dr. Robin White will join me on this presentation. But you wanna, wanna share a project they're really excited about uh, that involves the Smart Farm Innovation Network, uh, which is a college uh, university-wide uh, initiative that leverages uh, some of the, the you know, three major areas that the university is really strong on, Virginia Tech is really strong on, which are engineering, uh, computer science, and agriculture. Um, so the goal of the Smart Farm Network is really to leverage those three areas uh, to, to help create solutions uh, to, to current challenges that we face on animal agriculture and agriculture in general. So specifically, our project is related to precision animal agriculture, right? Smart Farm uh, related to beef cattle and also uh, equine. So if, if you are in agriculture, primarily like uh, crop production, so corn and soybeans, you know, precision agriculture is not a term that it's, it's uh, new, right? Uh, you're very aware of the technology that's available from, from, from the seed to the tractor that we use to plant, the, the GPS that every tractor has now, uh, the technology that's available on the harvesters that let us know the exact productivity of each uh, square footage of our field. So the, the amount of technology is amazing. If you're not a dairy producer, you're probably aware of precision animal agriculture technologies, right? Every cow now in a dairy has a sensor that can help track activity of those cows. It can help us determine if that cow was eating today, if the cow drank water today, um, and help us detect estrus or heat so that we know when to breed those cows. Um, so the, the, the concepts and technologies around precision animal agriculture in the dairy industry are not um, so, so foreign. But for beef cattle producers, especially uh, cow-calf uh, cattle production, those technologies are not so adopted. Um, and some of the reasons uh, that happens, it's, you know, there's challenges, right? Uh, where most beef cattle production happens out here in the pasture, uh, where there's not necessarily a power supply readily available. There's no internet connection or there's poor internet, uh, internet connection. And, and those are challenges that um, doesn't allow the use or beef cattle producers to take advantage of those technologies. So. Uh, a team of researchers that include myself, Dr. Robin White, uh, Zach Easton, Gota Morotra, uh, Dong Ha, and Daphne Yao, as well as the superintendents at uh, the Shenandoah Valley, uh, Gabriel Pan, and at the Middleburg Agriculture Experiment Station, uh, take the light lead. Uh, we, we, uh, we developed this program to, to create test beds to test those technologies, as well as develop new technologies and investigate uh, the challenges that, that happen when we're trying to, to incorporate those technologies on extensive uh, production, such as beef cattle production. Uh, because, you know, like I said, uh, those animals are not necessarily on the barn every day uh, where they're close to a power supply and we can collect data and, and so on. So, with the help of the college, uh, we, we are uh, equipping those test beds um, to, with, with um, infrastructure that involves you know, fencing, new water lines, uh, whatever is needed, as well as purchasing equipment uh, that are already available for, for in precision animal agriculture. So a couple of examples of those are smart scales, which you have purchased. And those scales, they go in front of a water supply and every time the animal drinks water, we have a, uh, a weight collected on those animals. So, you know, think about, uh, you know, imagine a situation where you don't need to bring your cattle to, to the facilities and run them through the chute to get a body weight. Right? How nice that, that would be. So, we're going to test that. We're going to test if that's if it's feasible. So part of the project, not only testing those technologies, but creating new sensors, which Dr. Robin and I talked about it, those wearable sensors that help us determine if the cow is sick, that cow ate today, help us locate that cow in the pasture, um, for example. And you know, more broadly, not only that we're 
or mm -hmm. focus on understanding those technologies and bringing those new technologies, but also understanding the challenges with data transmission, you know, how that data can be downloaded to a device that we can actually use that data then to, to, to make decisions, right? Uh, so there's challenges on how the data is transmitted, how the data is recorded as well, how this, that data is, is recorded in a safe way. So there's definitely concerns of cybersecurity, which is also another important part of this, um, of this project, right? So what I really, uh, my, my, uh, my goal on, on this project, it's really understanding how can we get all that data, right? Because it's awesome, it's amazing. We can, we can uh, collect rumination, we can know where the cow is, we can determine the temperature of that cow, we can determine all those things. But what can we do with that data, right? We get an immersed with all this data, but how can we boil that down uh, and, and create solutions out of that data so that we can tell producers, okay, here's an alert for that cow and she didn't drink water today. So here's something you can do, right? How can we use all that data to create uh, solutions so that producers can uh, actually make management decisions, right? So we're really excited um, for uh, our timeline for this project to start collecting data on beef cattle um, is September. Uh, so, you know, stay tuned. There's a lot coming uh, with this project. And we're also planning a virtual field day uh, that's going to be focused on precision animal agriculture later in the fall. But we're really excited. Uh, and you know, there's only good things that's going to come out of this. So stay tuned. And Robin? that, I'll pass it on to you. Thanks, Vitar. Obviously, Vitar is much more brave than I am deciding to um, exemplify some of the challenges with precision animal agriculture as I'm in the office today. I'm going to just elaborate a little bit on some of the types of wearable sensors that we're testing as a part of these um, test bed facilities. These sensors focus predominantly on um, remote monitoring of grazing animals. And as Vitor has said, one of the big objectives that we have is to understand where we're sensing things that are redundant to try and improve the usability of data coming out of these systems um, so that it's decision-based as opposed to um, kind of information-based. Because it's very easy, and we've seen this in other fields, particularly um, in the dairy industry as an example, it's very easy to collect um, tremendous amounts of data on a daily basis. It's very challenging to figure out what you should do with that data. So we have a number of sensors that we're testing. Some of them are commercial sensors, so I brought a little example here. This is actually a subcutaneous implant that goes in the neck of cattle and it has a battery life of about two years and it will monitor the animal's heart rate, respiration rate, and body temperature. So you can get vital signs on that animal at any point in time um, sent directly to your smartphone, right? Vital signs are something that we do know quite a bit um, in terms of how to interpret. So that's a pretty useful technology. Um, we're still working on some of the challenges associated with a subcutaneous implant, things like how does uh, FDA and USDA view um, putting technology in, into an animal that's destined for food production. So we're a little far away from having that be commercially available in the US, but um, it's an interesting technology that's coming down the pipeline. For those of us that are concerned about um, actually putting a sensor inside the animal, we have the equivalent technology, um, which can be placed on the animal's ear or its tail or its leg to monitor, again, those same vital signs. And then our team is also working um, with the engineers and the computer scientists on testing um, some larger sensors. So this is just a little Tupperware that's housing a um, test sensor that we're looking at that can not only evaluate things like pulse and temperature, but also classify an animal's activities, um, look at its proximity to different objects and the color of that object so we can tell if it's standing next to a tree or a fence or next to another cow, perhaps if it's looking at grass or if it's looking at a feed bunk. Um, we can tell the GPS location of the animal. Uh, we can monitor the sound in the animal's local environment and do things like look at the local temperature, relative humidity and pressure experienced by the animal. So we call that kind of the data overkill sensor. But what we can do with all of that information, again, is coming back to this question of 
trying to figure out the best way to use the information and to reduce redundancies. If we only need to know how an animal is spending its time and we don't need the rest of that information, we can push this complex sensor down to a very simple piece of equipment um, that has high usability. As Vitor already mentioned, some of the big uh, research objectives that we're trying to work on are, are doing things like how we can improve um, the transmission of data. So most commercial sensors focus on Bluetooth or Wi-Fi based data transmission, which we know just doesn't work well in a pasture based system. So our team is working predominantly with uh, LoRa networks, which are effectively sending data over radio signals. Um, so you have roughly a 10 kilometer radius that you can collect data from um, with a single gateway, which is a much better solution for our grazing systems. And indeed, we've got some really um, some nice data coming in, looking at GPS locations of animals that are being sent in real time over those LoRa networks. Um, one of the other challenges that we're working to address is enhancing the energy use efficiency and the battery life of these systems. I mentioned our subcutaneous um, implant that we're testing has a battery life of about two years. Uh, that might be all right for things like feedlot animals or for um, some of our sheep, but certainly for things like our breeding cows or horses, we would want uh, a battery life that's a little bit longer than that. Um, so we're working to try and improve the energy efficiency, or I should say the engineers are working to try and improve the energy efficiency of some of these technologies. And then um, maybe the, the biggest objective that we're working on with our in-house um, tests is to try and reduce the cost. So this is a smaller implant, but um, right now the production cost um, could be close to $200 if you wanted to purchase that. Um, this larger device that we're playing with that measures all of um, these additional things costs us about $25 to make. Um, so if we can reduce the number of things we need to sense down to only those that are most necessary, you can imagine that we could improve the cost of that considerably more, perhaps even to a point where it's um, more cost effective for, um, for use on your average animal as opposed to maybe just picking one or two animals that you'd want to be indicators. I will say too, as we're establishing these test beds, one of the things that we're really excited about is the possibility of citizen science and partnerships with our producers, um, both partnerships in terms of testing technologies, but also in terms of getting perspectives on how, um, how existing commercial technologies work, um, how they perform on farm. We fully acknowledge that our nice little research test bed is not representative of the real world. Um, so if there's any interest in folks in getting involved um, in these projects early on, we welcome participation and look forward to, uh, to hearing from you. I'll turn it back over, um, I guess, either to Gabe or to Vitor. Thanks, Robin and Vitor. Next up, uh, we've got uh, John Benner, who's our local animal science extension agent. Uh, John is going to present on a summary of some data that he has uh, gone through from the AREC here, the herd that we've got here at the farm. All right, uh, so uh, as Gabe uh, introduced me, I'm John Benner. I'm the extension agent here in Augusta County. Um, I came up with a presentation looking at benchmarks for beef production, looking at McCormick Farm production benchmarks uh, over the last uh, decade. I wanted to start with just some definitions of benchmarks and what is benchmarks? Uh, what is benchmarking when we think of um, cow-calf? production, especially on a commercial sense. And really, if you look through industry literature, through extension literature, uh, it's often seen or represented as standard performance analysis or SPA. Many of us producers uh, get IRM SPA red books uh, from Farm Credit or other sponsors, uh, NCBA, uh, to record calf birth dates and things like that. Uh, SPA is really the full analysis of uh, commercial um, beef cattle production and profitability. It really is a standardized measure of production and profitability in commercial cow-calf systems. A um, couple reproductive measures that are important, uh, starting with pregnancy percentage. Uh, and again, probably the, the big takeaway with pregnancy percentage is for producers to uh, pregnancy test their animals. Um, definitely is a great way to find open cows early, uh, even if we're excellent managers, we're out there with our calves 
all the time. Uh, it'll still be probably an, an extra interval before we notice an open cow uh, versus uh, having her preg checked. Uh, then probably the numbers that are important from a uh, economic standpoint are calving percentage and weaning percentage. Uh, calving percentage, weaning percentage both were paid off of. Weaning percentage is perhaps the most important because it's directly related to having a calf wean, taking it to market, or backgrounding it for 45 days for a preconditioned program before marketing. Uh, definitely is that number we really need to look at and improve from a reproductive standpoint. For growth and production measures, uh, we're very familiar with these most likely, uh, especially weaning weight. Uh, all of us as, as commercial cow-calf producers can very easily calculate uh, that average uh, for most instances. Uh, also important is uh, the adjusted to a five-day weaning weight. A lot of us purebred cattle producers are very familiar with this. Um, it provides a standard age and standard age of dam we can compare calf performance to. Weight per day of age also is a good measure of how well our calves are growing. And then the probably the, um, the measure that looks at efficiency both from reproductive and growth in production is pounds of calf weaned per cow exposed. What do we need to, to be able to use these for? If we look at these numbers for our own operation, uh, we need a way to compare it. Uh, so if you're familiar with, uh, I think, North Dakota State's uh, CHAP system, they publish some benchmarks on an annual basis. There's also a Southwest Texas A&M and uh, New Mexico, Oklahoma benchmark system, uh, the Southwest SPA. So we wanted to look at some of these from a Virginia standpoint uh, using uh, the station numbers there at McCormick Farm. Probably uh, one takeaway uh, from this talk I'd like for producers to have is just what do you need to collect uh, some of this information? And, and really it comes down to records uh, in a word. Um, also, you need to have a good animal ID system. Uh, probably to compare those reproductive measures uh, and percentages fairly, you need to have a defined breeding season. Um, we won't talk about these today, but a full SPA analysis looks at profitability, um, and you probably need to have receipts, uh, cost estimates, as well as uh, receipts from sales of cattle uh, to really evaluate uh, the profitability of an enterprise. So again, I did mention the SPA analysis tools are available online. A lot of them are regionalized. We have a lot of emphasis uh, from Western uh, areas of the, the country that do a good job of looking at it. So wanted to really see what tools we had within uh, Extension to do that. Uh, we do have a Extension publication uh, that serves very well in this capacity. The Virginia Cow Herd Performance Checkup uh, it's number 400791, uh, and it reviews uh, sort of a good step-by-step -step way to calculate some of these uh, measures. To review a couple of them uh, real briefly, uh, pregnancy percentage, and just the important thing with looking at the pregnancy percentage is taking your total exposed females and then looking at that preg check sheet and then subtracting any female that was open prior to you marketing her. Um, and then divide that by the total number of exposed females. Generally, uh, that number is not gonna be 100%, so always look for a cow or two, maybe you left off the list, uh, if, if you get a, a, a really high number. Herd calving percentage, um, you wanna probably use the total number of females calving and then divide by that total number of exposed females. Uh, so you wanna use that same number in the denominator when you're calculating your calving percentage to get that true reflection of, of what your reproduction and your fertility program are accomplishing. Then the percent calf crop weaned, you wanna look at the total number of calves that you weaned divided by the total number of cows exposed. Even for the best of managers, uh, normally this number decreases, you know, probably no more than gradually, but probably will still decrease from pregnancy percentage to percent uh, or weaning percentage. A couple other important measures. Uh, one I wanted to really take a few minutes on was the percent calving in the first estrus cycle. 
if we're doing a lot of AI breeding, uh, we might know this as our AI breeding percentage and uh, using a textbook figure and again realizing maybe not all cows are 21 days in their estrus cycle, but breaking it up with 21 day periods, if we're trying to look at the number of cows that calved in the first estrus cycle or from day one to day 21 in the calving season gives us a pretty good measure of how well we're doing getting cows bred and keeping them bred. And I've got a graphic a little bit later that shows the importance of that for production. Another thing with that number is we probably need to calculate that differently for our mature cows versus our heifers, um, mostly because a lot of times we're setting up our replacement heifers a little bit earlier in the breeding season. And we need to calculate the mature cows separately, not to skew uh, that number. The pounds of caffeine per cow exposed, um, this is similar to that percentage, but we're looking at the, the pound figure. And we're taking the total pounds of our calf crop uh, divided by the total number of cows that were exposed to breeding. We can also calculate it probably by just using the weaning percentage that we talked about in the previous slide times our average weaning weight. Here, weight per day of age, uh, we cover, we used a uh, weaning weight divided by the age. And you're probably familiar with weaning weights and adjusted to a five day weights. So here's a table looking at spring calving years. Uh, many of you are familiar that the research station at McCormick Farm switched from spring calving to fall calving in 2013. So 2009, uh, 2010, all the way to 2013, we saw and I'm reporting some of the production figures here uh, for spring calving. One thing I'd call your attention to is you see a pretty big difference in large range in calving percentage, perhaps maybe due to weather incidents related. Often when we're thinking of spring calving, that's always a factor. However, they have an excellent breeding program at McCormick Farm, so we actually did see strong percents of cows calving in the first 21 days. This is better than some of the producer surveys I have in some of the areas I serve. 53% uh, uh, to 60% of cows calving in the first 21 days. Uh, you need a very good breeding program to accomplish that. Weaning percentage uh, for, for the, no, the data I compiled, um, 2011 just with that lower calving percentage was down at 79%. The high according to these figures I had was 89%. So pretty decent showing for weaning percentage for the cow herd that was exposed. Weaning weights uh, were in the 400s, um, but if you look at the calf age, they're weaning a little bit earlier than probably some producers are uh, with 181 to 203 days of age at weaning. If you adjust those up with 205 day weaning weights, uh, they show over uh, 500 pounds, um, 509 pounds to 624 pounds. Um, with an average of uh, 549 as that adjusted weaning weight. And also weight per day of age, 2.45 pounds. So close to 2.5 pounds in terms of a weight per day of age. And pounds of caffeine per cow exposed, average for all those years was 388 pounds. Here's a table looking at fall calving. 2013 through 2018 was the, the numbers I was working with. And you see a, a tighter uh, range there in the, the calving percentage, um, maybe just due to better conditions uh, with fall calving, but pretty much 89 to 92% uh, calving that year. And pretty good numbers for percent of cows calving in that first estrus cycle with an average of 56%. Uh, weaning percentage, again, uh, the range was tighter, pretty much 84% to 88%. Our weaning weights were very similar to uh, spring calving, which is a little surprising, as we often think that fall calves are generally smaller than spring calves. However, if you look at the age figure here, you see that um, pretty much all of the fall calves uh, were weaned at an age over 200 days, over 202 days of age. Uh, and that actually adjusted their two or five day weights back to really a number very similar to um, what you would maybe see, actually less than what you saw for 
uh, your spring calving. And as you'd expect, perhaps due to that, you had a lower weight per day of age, at least for McCormick Farm for these years I was looking at. 2.23 uh, was that average um, really from 2013 forward in terms of the weight per day of age for the fall calves, which you might expect being, being less than the spring calves. But very similar, pounds of calf wean per cow exposed, 399 uh, was the average for those fall calving years. So told you I would talk a little bit more on the importance of having cows bred in that first estrus cycle. So I wanted to conclude with this graphic. Uh, and this is just one year, um, 2016 uh, calving year. So I believe these would have been, these calves would have been weaned uh, the following uh, year. Uh, but you've got the uh, bar graphs here looking at the percent uh, over here on the, uh, the right side, percent of females calving. Our heifers, I think we had about 70% of them calve in the first estrus cycle, and um, about 44% uh, of the mature cows. The lines here represent the average weaning weight of those cow groups based on their estrus cycle. So our mature cows weaned an, an average, uh, if they were in the first estrus cycle, 517 pounds. And if they didn't calve until the second estrus cycle, the average weight of those calves, and this is steers and heifers, uh, weighed 495 pounds. So just, again, this is just one year of data, but we saw a 22 pound advantage for those calves born in the first estrus cycle versus the second. If they were a first calf heifer, there was a 31 pound advantage if they were born in the first estrus cycle. So just some things to think about in terms of the importance of reproduction with weaning weight and possibly profitability. So uh, that kind of concludes my prepared comments. And, and Gabe, I'll go ahead and turn the uh, mantle back over to you for questions. Thanks, John. Um, we're running behind, so I'm going to go ahead and ask you to just take a look at the question and answer box. These questions come up, if you could please uh, work on those. But I appreciate okay. you joining us today. Uh, next up, we've got a couple updates on the Asian longhorn tick and also uh, Tyleria. We're going to start off with Tree Dellinger. Uh, would you go ahead and... Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Tree Dollinger, and I'm a diagnostician in the Insect Identification Lab at Virginia Tech. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about the Asian longhorn tick. The Asian longhorn tick was first recognized in the U.S. in November 2017. The owner of an Icelandic sheep in New Jersey reported a large number of ticks on her animal that were identified as Asian longhorn tick. The sheep and pasture area were treated for ticks, but more ticks were found the following spring. The Asian longhorn tick is an exotic species native to Asia, including China, Japan, Russia, and the Korean Peninsula. It has spread to Australia, New Zealand, and some of the Pacific Islands, where it's a pest of livestock. We don't know when or how the New Jersey, tick, uh, New Jersey sheep acquired Asian longhorn tick as it hadn't traveled anywhere, but we now know that Asian longhorn tick has been in the U.S. for years, but had not been recognized as an exotic tick. Researchers looked at older collected tick specimens and saw that Asian longhorn tick was found on a dog in New Jersey back in 2013. The oldest known specimen of Asian longhorn tick what to date found was on a white-tailed deer from West Virginia in 2010. These ticks were probably misidentified as our native rabbit tick, which is a sister species to the Asian longhorn tick but we didn't have any reason to expect exotic species of ticks at that time, so that's probably where it was misidentified. The first specimen of Asian longhorn tick in Virginia was found in Albemarle County and was submitted to the ID lab for identification in January 2018. It was confirmed as Asian longhorn tick in May 2016, excuse me, May 2018, and a second specimen was submitted from Warren County just a few days later. By June of 2018, Asian longhorn tick was identified in several counties as indicated on the slide on the left. As on June 15th of this year, 30 counties in Virginia have known to have Asian longhorn tick. Looking at a larger map of the United States, Asian longhorn tick has been found in 12 states to date. You'll notice there's one county in the upper northwest of Arkansas that's positive. This population might have traveled there by human assistance, but we don't know how far west the populations actually reach. So what does this tick look like? 
It's a small nondescript reddish brown tick. It has short, broad mouth parts. It has a little flare to those mouth parts. It uh, does not have white markings on it like Lone Star Tick or American Dog Ticks. It measures about a tenth of an inch uh, when unfed, about a fourth of an inch, excuse me, 0.4 inches with a full blood meal. There's an unfed tick on the slide beside a penny for a, side com a slide comparison. It's small and it blends in with dark animal hair that most people probably wouldn't notice at all. Why is it called the Asian longhorn tick? Well, if you see in these red circles on these um, images, you'll notice that there are horns or spurs on the mouth parts, and that's where the name comes from. So what's different about this tick? As I mentioned, this tick is very small and hard to see. While both males and females are found in their native range in Asia, invasive populations of the Asian longhorn tick appear to be parthenogenic in the United States. We haven't found any males to date. This means that females can uh, start laying their eggs as soon as she matures without mating. The parthenogenic reproduction means the tick can be found in large numbers. It feeds on a large host range of animals, including domesticated animals, wildlife, and humans. It, it, it does feed on birds and may be carried by them to new areas. If a bird carries a female Asian longhorn tick and it uh, drops off and survives, then it could establish a new population in that area. It spends most of its life in the environment off the host, as much as 80% of its life. It appears to be well suited to our environment and climate with no apparent trouble in surviving our winters. The Asian longhorn tick is a suspected vector of Tyleria and cattle, which the other speakers will cover in more detail. But this disease is the current concern regarding this tick. So how should you manage this tick in your cattle? These recommendations are a condensed version of our fact sheet on Asian longhorn tick management practices for cattle producers that's included in these proceedings. To start, regularly inspect your cattle for ticks whenever possible. I know most of them are pretty wary of humans, but if you can get them in a chute, check them over. And not just a visual check, you'll wanna run your fingertips over the body. You can feel them with your fingertips easier than you might see them on a dark colored animal. You really need to check them over, including looking at the ears, the neck, the flank, the armpits, the groin, under the tail. Make sure you've checked any purchased animals for ticks before you add them to your established herd. Any animals that show signs of lethargy, low weight gain, and general unthriftiness should be evaluated for ticks. Animals with large numbers of ticks should be treated for ticks, and animals identified as having Asian longhorn tick on them should be suspect for Tyleria because the association between the tick and the disease is so strong. Once Asian longhorn tick has been identified on your property, you should assume that you have an established population in the area and that management for the tick is gonna be an ongoing process. We really, at this time, don't think that eliminating Asian longhorn tick from an area is feasible. We need to remember several things about this tick that affect how the tick should be managed. Asian longhorn tick can occur in high densities. We've had reports of people with hundreds of these ticks on their cattle. Um, the tick is active from February through November. That gives the tick a long period of time to find host, feed, uh, mature, and lay eggs. Populations of Asian longhorn tick in the United States are parthenogenic. Each egg produces a clone of the mother tick. And that's a really important thing to remember because if the mother tick is pesticide resistant, then we would expect all the offspring of her to be resistant as well. This is the reason why we're asking that producers rotate the classes of pesticides that they use to manage this tick in order to avoid the development of pesticide resistance in the tick populations. The good news is that we're not aware of any pesticide resistance in Asian longhorn tick in the United States. Any material labeled for tick control should be effective for Asian longhorn tick. You may find a product labeled for deer ticks, ear ticks, or just ticks in general, but the pesticides companies haven't had time to put Asian longhorn tick on their labels yet. But if it's labeled for ticks, the material should still work as long as it has tick on the label. The bad news is, is that management of Asian longhorn tick will be more complicated than managing other external parasites. And that's because Asian longhorn tick may require more pesticide applications over the bulk of the year. 
due to large populations and its lengthy activity period. A single pesticide application is probably not going to be effective in controlling Asian longhorn tick in a satisfactory way. Chemical control should be combined with other tactics, such as keeping pasture short and keeping cattle out of the woods if at all possible. But let's look at chemical control before we discuss general herd management. We suggest using insecticidal ear tags in conjunction with back rubbers, bullets, and similar devices charged with insecticide. The insecticide in the ear tag might not reach enough body surface area to be fully effective against Asian longhorn tick, and the back rubbers will help spread more material over the body. Remember, not all ear tags are labeled for ticks and not all ear tags you can purchase online are registered for use in Virginia. We recommend avimectin and beta cyfluthrin ear tags. Tag both adults and calves if the pesticide label allows. Switch between these pesticide classes of ear tags to slow pesticide resistance when possible. Charge back rubbers and other devices with phosmet or permethrin. Ideally, cattle will contact the back rubbers every day. So place them in pinch points, such as in a walkway or between posts or on the way to the water source. Hanging them over a mineral feeder might help, but cattle don't take salt every day. So they may not get enough exposure if that's the only place you put up a device. We know that um, high risk periods for Tyleria occur between February and March and August through October but these ticks are active February into November. So you may need to keep, treat your cattle if you're finding animals with high tick numbers. So what do you do if you have uh, cattle with heavy tick densities? Well, we recommend using porons. They're very effective. Uh, follow the label decoration directions regarding how and when to treat. Make sure you're using material recommended for ticks. Remember that heavy rain can wash off any porons, especially if they were just applied. Watch for fly numbers after heavy rain. Lots of flies on cattle may indicate that the need to retreat because the material is washed off. We generally don't recommend treating pastures unless tick densities are severe. Carbaryl, labeled for pasture, can be applied in fields with the highest tick densities. However, this should be done along with other recommendations. Pasture treatment alone probably won't take care of the problem of Asian longhorn tick. So here are some recommendations just for general herd management. You wanna treat all your animals at the same time, of course. We recommend keeping your pastures mowed short and long grass and brush should be mowed and cleared when possible. That's because these ticks spend a lot of time at the ground level where the humidity is high. And if you can decrease that shade, it will help desiccate them. Ticks can go a long time without feeding, so keeping cattle out of the field won't necessarily reduce tick densities. Also, Asian longhorn tick feeds on a lot of other animals and they'll be in the fields even before you turn your cattle back in there. If possible, keep your cows out of wooded areas. Ideally, a pasture wouldn't share a fence line with a wood lot if you can, but if you do have cattle in wooded areas, keep an eye on them for high tick numbers. Asian longhorn tick does feed on other animals, including domesticated animals, sheep, goats, horses. Also, they'll feed on dogs and companion animals. And it's a recommendation that you check yourself for ticks when you're working with infested animals or in tick infested areas. We uh, know that Tyleria doesn't affect humans, but we do know that these ticks do vector human diseases in other areas, especially its native range. So if you do find a suspect tick, what, what should you do? Well, we recommend that you collect samples and place the ticks in a vial of alcohol, hand sanitizer, some kind of preservative. We ask that you collect multiple specimens because we look at the mouth parts of the ticks to identify the ticks. And when you're removing a tick from an animal, sometimes the mouth parts will pull out or break off. So if you include lots of the ticks, then we have a greater chance of getting a tick with the full mouth parts. You can take these ticks to the Virginia Cooperative Extension Agent who will send those over to us at the Insect ID Lab for diagnosis. We use a diagnosis request form and there's some questions on there asking about how many ticks are on the animal, whether the tick was kept in a pasture, and some other helpful information that will be useful when we're trying to identify the tick. 
And just as a reminder, this is a free service for everybody, and it's not necessarily just Asian longhorn ticks. We'll also look at lone star tick, deer ticks, anything that you have a question about. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Gabe. Thanks, Tree. It's good to have you here. And I will mention that uh, Eric Day added a link in the chat box for more information um, from you all. And there will also be more information in the proceedings. So thank, thanks for being here. Thank uh, you. Next up, we've got Dr. Kevin Lommers from the vet school. All right. So I found this big guy in the Grayson Highlands down here in southwest Virginia. Um, I'm a veterinarian who happened to find the first uh, Asian longhorn tick in a cow in Albemarle County, and we also found Tyleria orientalis. Tyleria orientalis, uh, the Akita genotype, is clinically similar to anaplasmosis, so we're seeing anemia, weak cattle. Uh, as long, similar to the tick, it's uh, found in Asia, Australia, New Zealand, and associated with infectious bovine anemia is what they call it down there. In Australia, they estimate $20 million loss annually to this uh, Tyleria, and one farm, one dairy farm in New Zealand lost over a million dollars uh, as a result of an outbreak of Tyleriosis. Um, it's transmitted by the Asian longhorn tick or the Haemophysalis long longicornis. Uh, we've now demonstrated that in the U.S. Um, it can also be transmitted by needles or biting flies and potentially at low levels uh, from cow to calf transplacentally. Clinically, you'll see an acute infection. So the, the, the primary infection will be one to eight weeks after uh, the initial injection by the tick. Uh, but once cattle get past that acute infection, uh, they are lifelong infected with the potential for recurrence of clinical disease. There's an increased risk of anemia uh, is the primary thing, uh, and it's associated with periods of stress. Um, so calving, fall and spring calving, uh, seems to line up with when we are seeing most of the uh, cow loss, and then as well as periods of high stress from high temp or low water access. And then we can also see it in calves. This differs from anaplasmosis where we typically don't see clinical disease in calves. Uh, unfortunately, tyleria can lead to disease in, in younger calves. What do we know in Virginia? Uh, I've got a map here. We've detected it in at least 25 counties. Um, the blue is where we found the tick but haven't found the tyleria yet. Orange is where we found tyleria but not the tick. And red is where we found both. As you can see, and as Dr. Dillinger mentioned, uh, the distribution of the tick and Tyleria seem to be pretty similar. It seems to be following 81 and 64, um, and mostly where the cattle are. So we've done some random sampling with the help of VDAX in uh, the Shenandoah region and then here in Southwest Virginia. And we are seeing three to 7% of the animals that we sample are positive for Tyleria orientalis. That percentage has gone up from 2018 to 2019. So we're suggesting increased range and an increased percent positive. Uh, there are multiple genotypes detected. The one that's associated with clinical disease is Akita, and that's the primary one we're finding. We're also seeing that whenever our herd it, whenever an individual animal is identified as positive, if we go back to that herd, a large percentage of the animals in that herd are positive. That doesn't mean that they're clinically ill, it just means they're positive. Um, and so it's important to think of this not as an individual animal thing, but if you, find, if you have a positive animal, you, you need to think about that herd. Um, I mentioned calf loss is uh, a potential complication. We're looking at how much it impacts calf growth. And at this point, it doesn't appear to uh, significantly affect calf growth, especially uh, finish weight and uh, rate of gain, which is a good thing. Um, unfortunately, our treatment options are limited. Uh, there's some evidence that tetracyclines may make a difference, but if they're gonna make a difference, if they have to be treated early before there's clinical disease. Um, the only thing that works during clinical disease is not available in the U.S. and won't be available in the U.S. because of a really 
long withholding time on meat and uh, even the calves that were born to cows that were treated um, have a withholding time of nine months. So what we are left with is minimizing stress. So if you've got this happening in your herd, limit handling, uh, good nutrition plan, access to water, all things that you'd want to do anyhow, particularly affected animals. Some people have been pulling them out so that they don't have to compete for water and food. Just want to mention, think of Tyleria as a possible uh, disease whenever you're seeing anemia, weakness, icterus, or yellow cow, unexpected death. Uh, it can also lead to late-term abortions or calf loss. So some herds have it and have never had anything that looks like clinical disease. One herd, small herd, had a, a high percentage affected, but usually it's about one to five percent uh, cow loss on the initial outbreak. And then once it becomes endemic, once it's established in your herd, you don't see uh, nearly the death loss in the cows, although naive cows and calves are, are still potentially susceptible. So at this point, we recommend trying to control spread and uh, tick control is, is important, especially at high risk times. Dr. Dillinger went over that. Um, trying to avoid or use single use needles so that we're not spreading it with needles. Um, and think about the first clinical case in, in a herd potentially means it's a herd problem. And if you are positive, think about new cattle that you bring in and young calves and consider a source of cattle into the herd, um, depending on whether you're positive or negative in that herd. So this is where you can send samples, work with your veterinarian and extension agent to talk about this. Uh, I just wanted this information included. Thanks, Dr. Lammers, good to have you here. Um, Dr. Kern, can you wrap us up on uh, what producers need to know about the tick and, and thylaria? Sure. Uh, Tree and Dr. Lommers did a really good job talking about those two things. Uh, I'll just uh, cover kind of our herd, herd level deals. Uh, we're monitoring several herds that have severe or significant infection with uh, Tyleria. Many of those herds do not seem to be having any clinical disease. And we also, as many people are aware, uh, had the bull test station in Southwest Virginia that had a significant outbreak. Uh, shortly before the sale. Thus, they had over half of those animals were positive for Tyleria. Uh, we sold those animals with full disclosure that the herd was infected uh, and that many of those bulls were infected. And thus far, we have had no reports of those bulls having problems or any of the herds that they went to having problems. Uh, many of your people that are in your area, Gabe, are fall calving people. Uh, I do believe uh, that if we are likely to see trouble, uh, that it would be when those, it appears to be when those cows are kind of heavy pregnant. So over the next one to two months, maybe we are seeing a little bit more cases during that time frame. So it's something to have on your mind, particularly for fall calving uh, producers here in this next little bit. Cows that are, aren't acting right, you know, exhibiting the clinical signs that uh, Dr. Lommers uh, just went over. It's another thing to put on your on your list and, and talk to your veterinarian about. If you don't know what's going on, that's a good time to utilize uh, your local veterinarian uh, to, to check those things out and that sort of thing. Bottom line is, uh, I was really concerned about this disease a year ago uh, when some of these bad cases that Dr. Lommers talked about were popping up. Seeing more and more herds that are positive with no problems, uh, I think it's going to be a little bit of an irritant, uh, but it's not going to be a really bad problem uh, overall for our Virginia uh, cattle herds. Thanks, Dr. Kern. And I do want to point out that uh, Dr. Kern and Lommers both have uh, some information in the proceedings. And um, so if you need to contact them for more, just uh, send them a note. There's a question for you there in the chat box if you want to answer that real quick. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Dr. Lommers, do you want to answer uh, expand a little bit on what you mean by calf loss. Does that mean high percentage of open cows, death loss on baby calves, or both? We can see late-term abortion. We've had herds that suspected that this was going on. They were positive, uh, and they had a high late-term abortion. But typically what I'm talking about is the one to three-month-old calves 
um, that they'll have increased death loss of that one to three month old. All right, thanks. Well, that concludes our program for this afternoon. Um, I do want to thank all the faculty that have participated in, in producing these videos and also these live presentations. Um, it's been a lot of work and, and very thankful for their participation and help in, in doing them.